Welcome to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, now it's time for our post-fight recap of Melissa Odessa versus Cecilia Roman. A rather sizable step up in competition for Melissa Odessa, who sports a professional record of only 3-0. and oh. Against tough Argentinian slugger and reigning IBF bantamweight champion Maria Cecilia Roman, who sports a professional record of 15 wins, 5 losses now, though it was 4 ahead of this fight, and 1 draw. I have to preface everything I'm about to say with this. This is the kind of fight that is hard to score. This is the kind of fight that could lead to a lot of arguments post-fight because it all depends on what you're looking at. It all depends on what you're scoring. I underestimated Maria. I did decide to go with Melissa Odessa to win ahead of the match, but not just win, win by way of knockout. That's not what happened. And, and Melissa, I think, got a little more than she bargained for in Maria Cecilia Roman. A little. Having seen the fight two times now without any distractions. Maria's one tough cookie. Having not fought since August of 2019. What, what, what's that come to? About 17, 18 months of inactivity, 38 years old, in hostile territory, on foreign soil, giving the fight that she gave. This wasn't a bad advertisement for either fighter. I think that both Melissa and Maria gave as good as they got, and they both gave a very good account of themselves, given what they were coming from. Understand that Melissa Odessa has only had three professional fights. To Maria Roman's 21. Now 22, and lest we forget, Maria Cecilia Roman is the reigning IBF champion at 118 pounds. Oh. This was a rather sizable step up in competition for Melissa Odessa, though Maria isn't without her drawbacks. I reiterate, she hasn't had a fight since August of 2019. She's almost 40 years old. I wasn't expecting this fight to have the aesthetic that it did. The opening round I gave to Melissa Odessa because she was the busier fighter, exhibited a very good jab, Great body work, and she appeared to be the ring general. That what was happening was happening on Melissa Odessa's terms. The second round was a swing round. It was a round that you could have given to either fighter. There were good uppercuts and body work from Melissa Odessa, but very good hooks from Cecilia Roman. Good infighting from both, and both girls landed big shots. The third round I gave to Melissa Odessa. Good pivots, good body work from Melissa Odessa. Cecilia Roman, good infighting. She was attempting to smother Melissa Odessa's work, and that's important. That was a defining characteristic of this fight. That was a defining characteristic that could make the fight hard to score for some of you out there because Maria Cecilia Roman very quickly made the decision to take away Melissa Melissa Odessa's power, or try to, by smothering her work, by getting in a high guard, marching forward, and attempting to impose her will on Melissa mid-range to inside, where Melissa can't get full extension on her punches and can't add the same power to them as a result. This is important. It's important because it's an effective strategy to take something off of Melissa Odessa's punches so they're not landing as hard or as cleanly, but at the same time, she didn't completely disarm Melissa by doing this. There was effective in fighting from both fighters mid-range to inside. So while she was able to crowd Melissa Odessa, she wasn't able to disarm Melissa completely. I give the first round to Melissa, the second round was a swing round, the third round to Melissa, and the fourth round to Maria Cecilia Roman, who landed some big hooks on the inside, still continued to try and smother Melissa Odessa, and Cecilia Roman, she did appear to be the ring general, more so in the fourth round than in the previous three. I gave the fifth round to Melissa Odessa, who got back on her jab, got back on her boxing, created space with movement, using angles, using pivots, firing off good straight punches, good body shots, and good uppercuts in those moments where Maria was once again able to crowd her. I feel that the fifth round was a much better round for Melissa Odessa than the fourth round was. The sixth round I gave to Melissa on that same premise. She created space, used pivots, used movements. We saw body work. We saw good straight shots. We saw good uppercuts on the inside, though Maria Cecilia Roman did land a very good right hand towards the end of the round. The seventh round I gave to Maria Cecilia Roman for imposing her will, effectively smothering Melissa Odessa's power and landing some very big shots, some very big hooks. This wasn't a hard round to score at all. The eighth round, however, I interpret it as another swing round. Maria Cecilia Roman started off strong, backing off 
Melissa Odessa. But as she was backing her off, Melissa was landing shots, straight shots, as Maria Cecilia Roman was coming forward. And once again, these girls ended up in the phone booth. This did happen on Maria Cecilia Roman's terms, because that was her strategy. That was her plan all along. It's just that in spite of that going to plan, she had not completely disarmed Melissa Odessa. Melissa was still getting off body shots on the inside. I mean, that that's what makes it a swing round for me, that you want to stay on top of her, you want to stay with her, but in the process of doing this, you're getting off, yeah, but you're getting hit, too. Maria was. In both of those swing rounds, that was a defining characteristic that, while Maria Cecilia Roman is effectively crowding Melissa Odessa, she's getting hit. Oh. And while she's getting off shots of her own, she's still getting hit. We saw good body work from Melissa Odessa whenever they were on the inside. We saw very good uppercuts that split the guard of Maria Cecilia Roman. So it really isn't one way. It's not like Melissa was completely disarmed or flustered whenever Maria Cecilia Roman would crowd her. Ultimately, Melissa Odessa was given the decision, though she posted a comment up to her Instagram account that reads, now this is the kind of fight that motivates me. I wanted a quality opponent who would test me and that's what I got. Definitely have some things to work on and improve, but this is just the beginning. This is what I do. I want the best and I won't settle for less. Maria Roman showed why she is a current world champion with so many successful title defenses. Not happy with my performance and how close I allowed the fight to get, so I'd love a rematch despite winning. It was a great fight with a pleasing aesthetic. It was a fight where by the sixth round, at least on my card, Melissa Odessa had about four rounds in the bag. That's essentially saying that if I take both of those swing rounds, of which there were two, and I swing them Maria Cecilia Roman's way, you know what you get? What? You get a draw. And I think that for anybody that took this fight in, outside looking in, that maybe they're not paying close attention or, or, or maybe they don't have the luxury of having seen the fight twice and being able to score it, that, that anybody out there that was watching this thing, they might have been more satisfied had the judges called the fight a draw as opposed to awarding the decision to Melissa Odessa. I don't look at it as a gift because I reiterate, on my card, Melissa already had four rounds in the bag with two rounds left in the fight. And there were two swing rounds in this thing. If you swing a Melissa's way, Melissa wins a decision. If you swing both of those rounds, Maria Cecilia Roman's way, Melissa still doesn't lose. You end up with a draw. What makes the fight a hard fight to score is its defining characteristics as the fight really became a fight that for a good chunk of the fight, Maria Cecilia Roman is attempting to impose her will and smother Melissa Odessa's work. And, and she's effectively crowding Melissa, but she's not stopping Melissa from letting her hands go because Melissa was still getting off body shots and uppercuts on the inside. And it's important to note that. Maria effectively crowded Melissa, but she didn't disarm her. Look, it was a great fucking fight. It was a great shaking off the cobwebs fight for Maria and a great learning experience for Melissa. I reiterate, I think the fight was a good advertisement for both fighters. I don't really think there were any losers here in spite of how the judges might have had it. Will there be a rematch? I don't think so. I think they'll take their foot off the gas a little bit for Melissa Odessa's next fight. Neither of them's got anything to be ashamed of. Perhaps a rematch can happen sometime later this year, but I don't imagine that's going to be Melissa's very next fight. Congratulations to Melissa for adding another W to the column in what was only her fourth professional fight against a reigning world champion with 21 professional contests under her belt. I think it was a good advertisement for both fighters. I think it was a good advertisement for the sport. No complaints from me. I look forward to seeing more from Melissa Odessa, who is Ring IQ's 2020 Prospect of the Year. Continues to be ambitious, continues to be dangerous, and as far as I'm concerned, continues to be a cut above almost every and any other prospect at or around these weights. In other news, I'm sure most of you are aware that Adrian Broner managed to get a rather dubious decision against Giovanni Santiago, a dubious decision that his own stablemate, Jermel Charlo, is in an agreement with, and several others on Boxing Twitter. This comes as no surprise to me because while I didn't take in most of this fight, I only caught the tail end of it. After Oscar Valdez was done cleaning Miguel Burchelt's clock, uh, uh, the aesthetic of the match looked a lot to me like the aesthetic of the Jesse Vargas fight, a fight where, you know, Broner's not doing a heck of a lot out there. He's not throwing very much. He seems to be getting outworked by the other guy. That's the story that the punch stats tell us. Look at 83 jabs landed by Santiago to Broner's 49. 124 power shots landed to Adrian Broner's 49. Uh, a grand total of 207 punches landed to Adrian Broner's 98. Adrian Broner, the characteristically 
economic Adrian Broner, the characteristically underperforming Adrian Broner. Well, you didn't think that Giovanni was going to get a fair shake against this guy, did you? There were some thrills and some spells in this past weekend's action. Some surprises. I was surprised Oscar did what he did to Miguel Burchell. But if you tell me that Adrian Broner got a gift decision against an unheralded Giovanni Santiago, there's no surprises there. What were you expecting? You know, a couple of days ago, I iterated a sentiment here on the channel during a live stream that perhaps you guys out there might have missed as, you know, those streams, they do tend to run long, about an hour, two hours, what have you. So in case you missed it, well, you know, some of these fights that the PBC puts on, I don't even view them as actual contests. In some ways, I don't really even view the PBC as a, as a, as a boxing outfit in the boxing sense of the word, the sporting sense of the word. I mean, why'd Roly Romero get a decision against Jackson Mourinho's? Why is Adrian Broner getting gift decisions against Giovanni Santiago? What the hell is going on here? Rodriguez versus Gabayo was yet another dubious decision that happened in recent memory over there on the shores of PBC Island. You know, after that Zelfa Barrett versus Kiko Martinez fight, you had a lot of guys trying to pile on on how they're scoring fights across the pond. Oh. A lot of guys in a hurry to criticize the BBBOC. They conveniently sweep all this shit under the rug. These guys who want to poo-poo over how fights are being scored across the pond and paying no time and no attention to detail over how fights are being scored here in the United States. You got guys who want to write this off as you got to do more to beat an A-side fighter like Adrian Broner. But what the hell makes Adrian Broner an A-side fighter? The guy's a glorified journeyman. He didn't win yesterday's fight. Not based on what portion of the fight I saw and not based on how boxing Twitter is reacting to this decision. Why are they even keeping this fucking guy around? He only gets attention because he's a train wreck. You know, I don't even like spending a lot of time talking about Adrian Broner or whatever the hell's going on in his career, inside or outside of the squared circle. Because what the hell are we actually talking about? If I had to do a segment on every time Adrian Broner did or said something stupid... I'd never stop talking about the guy. Don't accuse me of being biased. Don't accuse me of being partial, as it's Adrian Broner's own stablemate saying that he got gift decision, among several others. Oh. That being said, you know, Adrian Broner getting a gift decision against some unheralded guy they conjured up for him that's supposed to be a lighter touch, but Broner being as undisciplined as he is... He's a journeyman. This is his level. This is where he's at. It's a glorified journeyman. What the hell is he even an advertisement for at this point? Boxing? What is he? A sign of the times that you can achieve notoriety by making an ass out of yourself? You don't actually have to be good at anything? You don't actually have to be talented? Just say or do stupid stuff on a regular basis and that'll keep you in the news. That'll keep the headlines. Talking about your latest fuck up. He's no advertisement for the sport of boxing as he's been reduced to getting gift decisions against unheralded guys like Giovanni Santiago. Him getting a gift decision doesn't surprise me. Of course, I told you. They're fattening him up for somebody. It's just a question of who. Is it Danny Garcia? Is it Keith Thurman? Or is it Regis Pregarius? Pick your poison. But that's the only reason they're keeping this fucking guy around. And finally, per tweet from Michael Benson, Oscar Valdez versus Shakur Stevenson is now being talked about after Valdez's KO of Burchelt last night to claim the WBC Super Featherweight title. Shakur is the WBO mandatory for Herring versus Frampton winner. So Valdez versus Shakur could be a big unification fight by the end of the year. And I agree with that sentiment because I don't imagine that Oscar Valdez is going to be taking on Shakur Stevenson in his very next fight. Oh, I'm sure that Shakur would like that fight to happen sooner rather than later, but it's conceivable to me that Oscar Valdez might be looking to fight the winner of that fight just as much as Shakur, with the difference being that Oscar Valdez is the current reigning WBC Super Featherweight Champion. And if he challenges the winner of that fight, it's a unification match that can be used to trump the mandatory. The mandatory being Shakur Stevenson, i.e. Shakur might have to wait. Bob Arum has said that the rearranged date for Herring versus Frampton will be March 27th or April 3rd in Dubai, UAE. He added that Michael Conlon could return on this card. There were some dubious details in reference to what happened there. We know what the reports were. That Carl Frampton, he's got like a twinge in his hand, something's going on, and, and they want to approach the Herring fight 100% because this will be Carl Frampton's bid to become a three-division champion. It's just that the Jamel Herring side of things, his team, Brian McIntyre, they, they're not buying it. You know, they think that the real reason that this fight has been postponed is because all of the financials in reference to the match haven't been ironed out. That they didn't even receive the airfare for this thing. They feel that they were kept out of the loop, they feel that they were in the dark, and there was a clandestine attempt to have the fight date rearranged Moved. for other reasons, that, that essentially Carl's not injured. It's all bullshit. But at this point, 
There's no sense in crying over spilled milk. These guys are supposed to be fighting in late March or early April in Dubai. It is what it is. And based on that schedule, that sequence of events, with Oscar having just beaten Miguel Burchelt and, and the winner of that fight set to emerge in either late March or early April, a fight between the two champions, regardless of who they are, you know, whether it ends up being Jamel if he keeps his belt or Carl if he takes it from him. A fight between the winner of that fight and Oscar Valdez could take place sometime towards the end of the summer and then the winner of that fight maybe fights Shakur Stevenson before the end of the year towards the end of it. Shakur's wanted to fight Oscar since they were at featherweight. That's essentially how he got elevated to WBO champion at 126 pounds before leaving that weight class. He became Oscar Valdez's mandatory challenger. Oscar had decided to chuck the belt, move up in weight because he was targeting Miguel Burchelt, who he just fought yesterday. Oh. Shakur is still hot on his trail, hot in his tracks. He still wants that fight. He wants a fight with any one of these guys, if we're being completely honest. And if I'm being completely honest, I want him to get those fights. I'm just not too hung up over the order that they happen in. If the pecking order is Valdez versus Burchelt, and the winner of that fight faces the winner of Herring versus Frampton, I'm okay with that happening that way before Shakur Stevenson gets a crack at the winner of those fights. Oh. It's not like Shakur Stevenson is in any danger of being aged out by these guys because all of these guys are older guys than he is. He's got plenty of upside and plenty of time. He needs to use it wisely. It'd be very difficult for me to lambast Oscar Valdez for not prioritizing Shakur as opposed to the winner of Herring versus Frampton because the winner of Herring versus Frampton is a world champion. That's a unification match. That's the kind of fights I want to see. It would be very difficult for me to criticize Oscar in that situation for not prioritizing Shakur and prioritizing the winner of that fight. Yeah, I can't criticize him for that. Especially since I didn't even think Oscar was going to make it through this past weekend's fight. I thought he was going to lose. I thought Miguel Burchelt was going to knock him out. Yeah, I can't give Oscar a hard time. If that's the way that this all happens, if that's the way the cookie crumbles, I really can't complain. If Oscar Valdez goes from Miguel Burchelt straight into a unification match with the winner of Herring versus Frampton, I can't complain in that situation. Oh, might upset Shakur Stevenson, but want doesn't always get, and you can't make everybody happy now, can you? Everybody's not going to get what they want when they want it. And I'm not unsympathetic towards the plight of Shakur Stevenson. I know that this is a kid who wants to prove himself against the best, against the best available fighters that are willing to fight. So I have no harsh criticisms for him either. Why would I? That's what you want from a young fighter. You want them to pursue those kinds of fights with those kinds of fighters, those kinds of champions. I mean, there's no real room for criticism here, if I'm being honest. For anybody. I understand Shakur wanting to fight Oscar or the winner of Frampton versus Herring, and I think there will be a time and a place for that. But if the pecking order is Burchelt, then the winner of Herring versus Frampton for Oscar Valdez, no, I can't criticize him. I can't lambast him. I can't complain. Shakur might have to keep busy with someone else. I don't imagine he's going to be happy about it, but that's how it might happen.